Let's read together then from the book of Revelation. Uh, I think we're enjoying this strange, wonderful book, aren't we? Perplexing, first time we hear it read, and this morning is no exception. Revelation chapter 13, and I'm going to read verses 1 to 18. You'll find it on page 5, or if you're uh, using your own Bible, you're welcome to do that as well, of course. Revelation chapter 13. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea. Remember the dragon where we left him last week, the last line in chapter 12, the dragon stood on the sand of the sea. And I saw a beast rising out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its heads. And the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, its mouth was like a lion's mouth. And to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. One of its heads seemed to have a mortal wound, but its mortal wound was healed, and the whole earth marveled as they followed the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, for he had given his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, and who can fight against it? And the beast was given a mouth, uttering haughty and blasphemous words, and it was allowed to exercise authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God, blaspheming His name and His dwelling, that is, those who dwell in heaven. Also, it was allowed to make war on the saints and to conquer them. And authority was given to it over every tribe and people and language and nation, and all who dwell on earth will worship it. Everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to be taken captive, to captivity he goes. If anyone is to be slain with the sword, with the sword he must be slain. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, and it spoke like a dragon. It exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence and makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose mortal wound was healed. This beast performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of people. And by the signs that it is allowed to work in the presence of the beast, it deceives those who dwell on earth telling them to make an image for the beast that was wounded by the sword and yet lived. And it was allowed to give breath to the image of the beast so that the image of the beast might even speak and might cause those who would not worship the image of the beast to be slain. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. Amen. Let me take us this morning straight into this passage. I want to drive, I want to dive straight in right away as the dragon, the devil, Satan. That's who we learned last week, the dragon is. I want to dive straight in as the devil, Satan, the serpent, conjures up these two great beasts, one from the sea, verses 1 to 10, and one from the earth. See, that's the point of that last line in in chapter 12, the dragon stood on the sand of the sea. In other words, he's perfectly placed one on one hand, one on the other, the sea on one side, the land on the other. And I think where we need to get to this morning in our sermon is very clear, isn't it? Verse 10, look at the end of verse 10. Here is a call for the endurance and faith of the saints. And verse 18, this calls for wisdom. When you face the first beast, verses 1 to 10, you are going to need to endure. And when you face the second beast, verses 11 to 18, you are going to need wisdom. 
We've called this sermon series in the book of Revelation, haven't we? We've called it Jesus Calling. This letter is the Lord Jesus calling to his church. Look what John says to us this morning, friends. Here is that call to endure and to be wise. Are you tired today? Let me ask you. Are you tired this morning from what it, what it means to be a Christian? It, it is taking spiritual, mental, physical energy from you like you never thought it would. Just simply to be here today, there are a hundred other things you could have been doing instead. I want you to hear the voice of the Lord Jesus this morning saying, stay with me, hold on, endure. Are you doubting this morning? Confused? Do you have questions about your faith? Do you feel intimidated intellectually as you try to share the gospel with people? Let me try and show you how you might find wisdom. So look at these two beasts with me from the sea, the first beast, chapter 13, verse 1, and straight away as we read, we are reaching for our recycling again, aren't we? Right away. John, who's writing these words, are in prison, isn't he, on the island of Patmos. His body is in prison, but John's mind is in the Old Testament. Oh, John knows his Old Testament like the back of his hand, and with his Scripture-saturated imagination, John sees a beast rising out of the sea. I saw a beast with ten horns and seven heads, with ten diadems on its horns and blasphemous names on its head, and the beast that I saw was like a leopard. Its feet were like a bear's, and its mouth was like a lion's mouth, and to it the dragon gave his power and his throne and great authority. Recycling. In the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, Daniel has a vision of four great animals rising out of the sea. And in the book of Daniel, the terrifying animals, the lion, the leopard, the bear, in the book of Daniel, those animals represented different world nations that ruled over the world. The Babylonians, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, and animals attached to those nations simply symbolized their strength. It's what we still do today, isn't it? The English lion, the Russian bear, the American eagle. And in the book of Daniel, you have four different animals for four different nations that followed each other one after the other. One after the other. But John takes all of that, look at it again in verse 2, and as John runs Daniel chapter 7 through his recycling machine, all four animals get rolled into one great animal, rolled into one beast. It was like <clears throat> a leopard like a bear, like a lion. See, what, what John is doing is, is taking those four great kingdoms that used to rule the ancient world, rolling them all into one and saying, this is Rome, the empire of Rome in John's day. And Satan the dragon uses nation states as one of his great weapons. Do you remember chapter 12, verse 12? Woe to you, O earth and sea, for the devil has come down to you in great wrath. He is now waging war on earth. How does he do it? Beast number one through nation states. Oh, it comes in different forms. It comes at different, uh, different expressions of world history. But if you want to really hurt the people of God, and remember that's what the dragon is doing, isn't he? Chapter 12, making war on the offspring of the woman. If you want to really hurt the people of God, you turn the state into a weapon. Turn the state into a weapon. This one beast is the embodiment of political power taking the place of God. This is, this is, put them all together. This is Babylon, the Persians, the Medes, the Greeks, the Romans. This is Egypt. This is Assyria. This is China. This is Russia. 
It is communism, it is fascism, it's Nazism. And friends, let's be clear about it. It is the British Empire. It is Western democracy. The first beast here in chapter 13, 1 to 10, is the tyranny of the state that makes itself absolute. The state that makes itself absolute. Now, here's the question, okay? Look at, look at the text again with me. What, what, the explanation I've just given to you, why doesn't John just say that? Verse, chapter 13, verse 1, and I saw the nation state rising out of the sea. And verse 2, and the nation state, the political empire that I saw was like a leopard. Why do this? So, I think we're enjoying this, aren't we? I think we're getting used to this. We're, We're learning in this book to think in terms of pictures and numbers aren't we? We're we're using our imaginations as we read. Listen to this. Here's here's what somebody said, a man called Daryl Johnson. He said this, imagery hooks us deep inside. Images can quickly and effectively convey that which we struggle to put into words. Imagery goes beyond the intellect and through the emotions into the imagination, grabbing us at the deepest recesses of our being images ignite the imagination. So, put your imagination glasses on and look at verses 1 and 2 again. What must John be telling us? Are human governments, nation states, are they cuddly, cozy kittens? Do you want to put a nation state on your lap and just gently stroke it? Or might the state tear you limb from limb? Let the image speak. The beast that I saw was like a leopard. Go go to the zoo when you can again. You are not going up to a leopard. You want thick, thick glass wire between you. Its feet were like a bear's. Its mouth was like a lion's mouth. Friends, listen to Daryl Johnson again. John is opening up for us the sobering, unseen reality of the present. Governments that step out from under the rule of God do not become more divine, they become demonic. Governments that exalt humanity as the measure of all things do not become more humane, they become bestial. Now, now that, is a, that is a world of truth to swim in right there. Maybe that is all some of you will do today. You just want to take that away and chew on it. Governments that exalt humanity as the measure of all things do not become more humane. They become animalistic, bestial. Remove God from the picture and say that human beings are everything. Human beings are are all there is. Human welfare is all there is. Exalt humanity as the measure of all things. Say, we've got this. We're strong enough. We can decide. We'll work out right and wrong. We'll protect you. Trust us. We don't need God. Governments that do that over time enact policies that degrade human beings more and more and more. Say that we are all there is, and very soon you will be treated as less than you actually are. I think we know that's true, don't we? Say that we are all there is, and very soon we will be treated as less than we actually are. Human life will lose its sanctity. Let's get rid of the weak, the infirm. Sexuality will lose its purity. Human worth will lose its dignity. Now, I'm I'm going to come back to this in just a moment. I want there to be lots of application today, but while we're doing this, okay, while we're using our imaginations, let me just show you how the rest of the imagery works in this chapter. I think you can do this now. You don't really need me, do you? You're getting the hang of this. Let's do the whole chapter really quickly. 
So look, look again at the beast, verse 1, 10 diadems, 10 crowns on its horns. Horns symbolize strength. 10 horns, lots of strength. And the crowns are on the strength, not on the head. You see that? 10 crowns on strength. It's a way of saying this, this beast is all about might and strength and power. It has seven heads, the number of completeness. So, this is all human governments in all their totality. Every nation state that ever exists is pictured in the beast. And verse 3, one of its heads seems to have a mortal wound but was healed. Well, I think this is John's imaginative way of saying you remove one world government and a new one will just take its place. You cannot kill the nation state. You cannot kill world governments. They will just always be there, and the whole earth will follow this beast for, do you see it, for 42 months. Verse 5, 42 months, three and a half years, remember, half of seven, the perfect number. In other words, for this time before the end of all things, not, not perfect time, not eternity, but for this time, these days. This short window before Jesus comes back, John is saying nation states will rule and people will follow them. And people will give such allegiance to the state that they are even worshiping it. Verse 11, now here's the second beast. The first one from the sea Sea in the Old Testament was the place that the Jews were really, really terrified of. It was dark, deep, unknown, untamable, unfathomable. A beast from the sea is a great picture of evil, uncontrollable government. The second beast comes from the earth, not as terrible as the sea. So, verse 12, this beast exercises all the authority of the first beast in its presence. So, this one is somehow subservient to the first beast, isn't it? Look what it does. Verse, 14, verse 13, it performs great signs, even making fire come down from heaven to earth in front of the people. Who did that in the Old Testament? Elijah, wasn't it? A prophet, someone on God's side. And verse 14, by these signs, it deceives those who dwell on the earth. So, so put the pictures together. The first beast uses raw muscle. It is all brawn. The second beast is brains. It is subtle. And look what John is saying. It uses religious means to put something tangible in front of people from the first beast that they can worship. The first beast is devilish political power, raw tyranny. The second beast, friends, is devilish religious deception. You see that? It, 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 it is something that looks like it might be from God, but in fact it is from the pit of hell. Look at verse 11. I saw another beast rising out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb. Ah, a lamb. Chapter 14, I looked and behold on Mount Zion stood the lamb. A beast who is like a lamb... But look, verse 11 again, it spoke like a dragon. The lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, that lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ is the lion lamb. He is meek and majestic. He is everything that is good and true and sacrificial and supreme. But this one, chapter 13, this one is the dragon lamb, a counterfeit lamb. Friends, can you see what John wants us to see? In these days, before the end of time, in his fury, the dragon wages war on the saints through the power of political tyranny and through the power of religious deception. What is Satan doing today? Immense national political power, immense religious deception. 
And in a way, the two are blended, aren't they? The, the lamb beast, the lamb dragon, clearly does his work in the presence of the mighty beast so that you, you have a kind of picture here of state-controlled religion state-controlled religious power, religious power that bends to the state first. Oh, this religious power looks good. It even sounds good. Makes it onto the television week after week, year after year, but it is serving the devil, not the Lord. It's why the number of the beast is 666. One less than seven, the number of perfection, and one less than seven three times over. So that it's, it's like saying no matter how hard this beast tries, it never reaches perfection. It always falls short. This beast is imperfection multiplied. He is perfectly incomplete. So near to the truth and yet so far. That, that, that number 666, friends, is, it's just a symbol. It's a way of saying that religious deception never looks like a one. It's, it's never obvious that it's wrong. It, it gets so close to the truth. It gets 666 close to the truth. Nearly right, but always wrong. Friends, can I just say that number 666 when we said we're doing Revelation, that's the one bit I had most comments about. Ah, what, what, I'm waiting to hear what 666, what are you going to say about 666? Never be worried about the number 666 in ordinary life, okay? I would stay in a hotel room number 666 if they gave it to me. If I turned up and they said room 666 without a second thought, if they said it's on the 13th floor of the hotel and I happened to book in that room on a Friday... And as I was walking down to the room, I saw a black cat in the corridor. I would take my room key, let me tell you, I would sleep like a baby all night long. I'd drive a car with 666 license. Our car actually has two sixes, so we're nearly there. P people get fixated on the number of the beast without being able to see the beast. Let me give you a controversial example, but I, I think this is true. If you listened several years ago to Bishop Michael Curry preaching a rousing sermon on love at the wedding of the Duke and Duchess of, Su of Sussex, Harry and Meghan's wedding, if you listened to Michael Curry's sermon on love and you marveled at his words but then you watched him just a few months later remove a colleague from his ordained office because that colleague does not believe in same-sex marriage. And Michael Curry stripped him of his pastoral office. Then you need to know you are looking at the beast. Can you see him? What does Rico Tai say? I've said it many times from here. The devil does some of his very best work in a dog collar or behind a Presbyterian pulpit or from a Pentecostal platform. John says to us, can you see the beast? Don Carson, who's a theologian in the United States, I heard him tell the story once of growing up in French-speaking Canada where, where pastors in his father's generation were jailed for preaching the gospel. And Don Carson remembers as a schoolboy standing up for Christ in the classroom and being openly mocked by the headmaster of the school, a brilliant, brilliant man who everybody admired and feared and openly mocking this schoolboy for being a Christian. Don Carson says, I knew there and then I was looking at the beast. Chapter 13, verse 5. The beast was given a mouth uttering haughty and blasphemous words. Oh, can we see, friends? 
Can you use holy imagination to look at this? Look, look at verse 16. Also, it causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both free and slave, to be marked on the right hand or the forehead so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark, that is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. Some of you be familiar with this. I, I grew up in a world where this was taken to mean, verse 16 was taken to mean that one day there will be chips implanted into people's hands and heads or, or, or barcodes actually was the big thing. I knew Christians who refused to have a credit card because it had a microchip in it. Maybe today it's vaccines, getting a chip implanted. No, no, that's not what this means. Whatever this means, it had to have made sense in John's day, doesn't it, to the first readers. This is not a science fiction futuristic manual. Microchips, barcodes didn't exist. No, look at the imagery again, the right hand and the forehead. Recycle your Old Testament. Do you remember Deuteronomy, the standout part of the law? Love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And, and do that so much, those words are so precious, God said, look, bind it onto your forehead, tie it onto your right hand, put it there so you see it every day. And some Jews, even to this day, take that literally. But here's the thing, head and hand, thinking and doing. One commentator says the forehead represents ideological commitment and the hand represents the practical outworking of that commitment. In your thinking, love the Lord your God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And in your doing, love the Lord your God, with heart, soul, mind, and strength. And all Satan does, he comes along, and all he does, it is all counterfeit. He, he mimics it. He apes it so that he uses religious power to deceive a world in, into, into the, showing that their thinking and their doing belong to the dragon. That's all it means. Here is a world intellectually, ment mentally captive to the dragon. Here is a world constrained to do the dragon's will, not the lamb's. So can I pull all of this together for us, friends? L look how powerful the first beast. Look how powerful. And look how dangerous the second beast now, they're both dangerous, of course, aren't they? But the, the second beast is dangerous in its subtlety and carefulness and deception. Nation states love power, and in loving power, nation states accrue to themselves blasphemous rights. The state demands total allegiance or else. Be very careful, friends, very careful of any state, Western, Eastern, democratic or dictated, be very care careful of any state telling you what you must think, must believe, must do. For it is what states do. Do you know, in, in, in the past months, friends, when uh, myself and our elders us as a church family, when I, when I did it, but with our elders' support, when we took part in the judicial review, taking the Scottish government to court over the closure of churches, that was not because we believed churches were being persecuted. Everybody was living under restrictions. No, what, what was happening there, we believed, is that a government for right intentions was hoovering up more power than it actually had. Power gain for right intentions quickly can be used for the worst of intentions one day. Nation states claim for themselves what belongs to God alone, don't they? They replace that allegiance to God with allegiance to them, and there can be nothing as intolerant as a state's view of tolerance. Friends, John is saying every world power Every world power, let's spell it out today, okay? Scottish nationalism, British imperialism, English imperialism, British unionism, 
American freedom, any one of those elevated to the level of ultimate power and absolute right will make you less human, not more. Less human, not more, because it will not lead you to the Lamb. You know, the, the, the beast's aim is to make you fear and to fear it, isn't it? Not him. Trust it, not him. And it will animalize us. And so it is, isn't it? All around us, we have reduced sex to basic animal instinct. And then along comes something like the Me Too movement that just shows the image of God is not erased in human beings. People get hurt. Someone puts their hand up to say, this is not right. There are things we should not do to each other while our Western governments mock Christ's people with haughty and arrogant words, they mock us for saying, please, please keep sex for marriage. Keep sex for one man, one woman. Western governments allow, don't they, the massive consumption of pornography that abuses and traffics women and dulls the sexual appetites of grown men, turning them into dogs like dogs on a street, no longer even feeling human. If in the past couple of weeks, friends, you voted for any of the major political parties, many of us did in different forms, if you voted for any of the major political parties, well, I'm thinking the ones in the TV debates, SMP, Lib Dems, Conservatives, Labour, Greens, if you voted for any of them, and as you put your X in the box, you could not see the shadow of the beast. Then you, you could not see what John can see. What do empires want? Verse 4, might, strength, power, dominion. And they will take your life if you stand in their way. They will take your life. Look at verse 7. This beast was allowed to make war on the saints and allowed to conquer them. And so, friends, verse 10, we simply have to endure. Hold on to Christ, and He will hold on to you. This is a call for endurance, isn't it? Not winning not winning. Do you remember how you conquer the dragon, chapter 12, how you win? You win not by winning. Oh, friends, it's so important, not by beating the state, but by removing the devil's power to accuse you. By the blood of the Lamb, learn to suffer well for Jesus. For some of us, friends, in this room will suffer at the hands of this beast. We just will. Christian teacher loses their job because of what they won't say in the classroom about same-sex relationships. Christian GP appears before a tribunal. Open-air preacher arrested. Parent abused horrifically on social media for expressing concerns about education in school. Friends, make no mistake, this is a war you're in. This is a war. Look at chapter 12, verse 17. The dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. And so look at chapter 13, verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Why do we need wisdom and not cleverness? Did you know that? You do not need intellect for the Christian life. You need wisdom. Parents, do you know that? It is not grades for your kids that matters, but character. Christian character, Christian eyes on the beast. And the need for wisdom here is great because the beast looks, 
He looks like not a beast, doesn't he? He looks like a lamb. Can you tell the real from the fake? What are your spiritual instincts like this morning? They say, don't they, that I don't know if this is still true, but they say, don't they, that you're trained to spot a forged banknote, not from studying the fakes, but from handling the original. You, you just know what the genuine article looks like. It, you, it feels like you can look at it and weigh it up. You can just tell. John is saying signs and wonders from heaven, prophecies, fire from heaven, and it is all fake false. Can you spot it? You know, Matt Matt Chandler, a pastor in the United States, he says this. He says, the kind of fight that John says we're in means that occasional church attendance on a Sunday now and again just won't cut it. If that's your level of studying the original, you are no threat to this beast. The devil loves having you in church. Now and again, yeah. But you're not serious about the Bible. You're not serious about the gospel. You're not serious about your sin, not serious about theology and grace and growing in grace. You are a sitting duck for the false prophet to lead you over a cliff, to lead you astray. If you can count on both hands the number of times you're in a church in a year, you are at Butlins, friends, by the coast. You are not in a fight. It's like going to the gym once a month, thinking you're keeping fit. You believe it. No one else does. No, friends, look look at the scale of this. John has pulled back the curtains of reality, hasn't he? And he says that between now and the end of time, the dragon has two hands. One crushes, the other comforts. One kills your life, the other one numbs your life, gives you enough religion to make you think it's not real. And so I want to say, first friends, at Trinity here, the, the, the formation of the Christian mind, the Bible, reading the Bible, theology-loving, gospel-growing Christian is really on our horizon for the coming years. I want to share that with you from our session the formation of the Christian mind, Bible reading, theology loving, gospel growing. You're going to hear a lot more about that in the coming months. We've tried as elders recently to live in the future. In other words, to, to take us from here to there to where we need to get to. One sermon a week is not enough to form deeply Christian people. Mid-August, God willing, if things continue, trajectory continues, God willing, mid-August, we return to two different services, morning and evening, two worship services. Can I encourage you, if that was your practice before, make it your practice again. If it was not your practice before, here is a clean slate, a fresh start. Make it your practice now. Husbands, dads in homes and families, time for a family discussion. This is what we do. This is what we do with our time on a Sunday, Saturday, family day, Sunday, church family day. This is where we are. Why why might we think like that and do that? It's because of Revelation chapter 13, isn't it? Look, Look at the depth of deception in the world. Oh, we, we want the gospel and we want teaching, we want church family as much as we possibly can. We, we've announced, haven't we, recently that from 1st of September we've got three new ministry trainees starting in our church family life. We want to send the gospel into the future. But, but what about all of us? Not just trainees, is it? What about all of us? 
In the coming years at Trinity, we want to develop and offer a full program of Christian theology that is accessible for all of us, embraced by all of us, so that we all know what we believe and we deeply believe it. We can have the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other and know how one informs the other and look at the world with deeply Christian eyes. And here's why we want to do this, friends, as a church family. We want to be captivated with the beauty of the Lord Jesus Christ. Isn't that right? I don't want us to finish this morning here with only seeing beasts. Not particularly pleasant, is it? Many commentators point out that this this whole idea of the lamb dragon and the, the beast mark on the head and the hand as opposed to God's law on the head and the hand Satan's great work is counterfeiting, isn't it? It's all a copy. It's all a copy. It it mimics so that actually what you have in Revelation chapter 13 is an unholy trinity. Did you notice that? A dragon and two beasts. How, How does the true trinity work? The Father sends the Son into the world and says that everybody should honor the Son as they honor the Father. And then the Son sends the Spirit into the world to bring glory to Him. And in bringing glory to the Son, He brings glory to the Father. See what the devil does here? He has never had an original idea in his life. He sees how God goes about things and he inverts it. He sends the first beast into the world to bring glory to him, and then he sends the second beast to bring glory to the first beast. An unholy trinity. Oh, how different from who God is, it's Father, Son, and Spirit, the God who makes and gives and sends, the God who comes and bleeds and dies. The only one who ever had a right to a throne and who surrendered it. The one who being in very nature God did not grasp at equality but emptied himself and became nothing. Oh, the closer you get to the real thing, friends, the closer you get to this God, let me tell you today, the closer you get, the more human you become, the more alive you will feel, and the more you will know and love Him. Amen.